So good morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on the, our your time zone. Uh, welcome to our session. This session is the Create an Environment session. My name is Joaquim Ferreira, and I'm a professor at the University of São Paulo, Brazil. There, there's a protocol for that. The session is being hosted by by Jin Liu from the Center for Global Trade Analysis, and the session is already being recorded. So we have four papers in this session today. Uh, uh, the first one is the economic benefits of international cooperation to improve air quality in Northeast Asia by Elisa Lanzi from OECD, Environment Directorate. The second is impacts on land use changes in the United States from global sources, uh, forces and drivers uh, from uh, by Angelo Gurgel from the MIT. Uh, the third one is the role of global agricultural market integration in regional economic modeling from Tsing Hao. Joint Global Change Research Institute. And the fourth one, uh, Approximate International Linkage in the National CG Model by Andrew Schreiber from the International Protection Agency. Right? So uh, I think it's a it's a very, a very interesting presentation. We have very interesting presentations and a very it's very challenging uh, methods and um, uh, issues. And uh, with no more to tell, I think we can uh, start. Uh, with Elisa. Good morning, Elisa. The floor is yours. You have 20 minutes for your presentation, then we have 10 minutes for discussion, and two minutes more to change uh, the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Um, thank you, Chair. So I, um, as introduced already, I will be presenting our work on the economic benefits of international cooperation to improve air quality in Northeast Asia. And the focus of the report is on Japan, Korea, and China specifically. This is a joint work with the colleagues at the OECD, but also part of a wider collaboration with um, experts at YASA and at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Right. So just to uh, highlight the motivation for this work, the um, Northeast Asian um, area is one that um, is still highly affected by air pollution, as you can see from this map from 2019 data. Um, but it's also an interesting area in which transboundary air pollution plays an important role between the three countries. So in that um, context, this report that I'm presenting today aims to quantify the long-term health and economic benefits of policy action to improve air quality in the three countries, Japan, Korea, and China, but also to see if there are additional benefits from international cooperation to address air pollution. Um, the report relies on an, an analysis with the CG model um, hosted by the OECD, so that's the OECD EMV linkages model. And the aim um, of an analysis with the CG model is to look at the interactions between sectors and countries, as well as to consider international trade effects of the different policy scenarios. Specifically, to compare two scenarios broadly, but I'll provide a, a more detailed description of the scenarios in a bit. Uh, so we look at a baseline scenario that reflects current policies on air pollution, and we compare that to a set of scenarios in which uh, countries deploy the best available technologies to reduce air pollution to achieve the maximum feasible reduction in air pollution. And uh, with that used as a basis, we provides an overview of different policy scenarios with um, varying levels of regional cooperation within the, within the area. Um, the time horizon of the analysis is 2050, so as to provide a mid to long-term uh, view. All right, so just a quick overview of the presentation. I'll start with um, explaining a bit about the methodology and then an overview of the policy scenarios, and then I'll show the main results and uh, wrap up for the summary. In terms of the methodology, as I said, uh, the main tool is the OECD EMV linkage model. This is a standard CG model based on the GTAP database. Um, it's multi-regional and multi-sectoral with around 25 regions and 42 sectors. 
Um, there is a full description of economies uh, that interact um, towards international trade and production structure. Um, all activity is part of closed link systems and we have equilibrium in all markets. The model is based on structural trends with uh, absence of business cycles. In terms of the dynamics, EMV linkages is a recursive dynamic model uh, with the specific specificity that has capital vintages. We worked quite a lot on this model to link uh, the economy to the environment and vice versa. So we include air pollution projection in the model, but we also include the feedbacks from air pollution damages to the economy. So the EMV linkages model is the main tool for the analysis, but because we're talking about air pollution, which um, also needs to be considered at the more um, local uh, level. We actually work together with um, uh, YASA and the Joint Research Center. So I'll quickly walk you through the steps of the methodology. So um, EMV languages is used to uh, provide projections of economic activity with sectoral and regional um, detail. And then the economic projections are linked to air pollution, so to uh, obtain projections of air pollutants for the different scenarios. And the air pollution projections are provided by Yasin's gains model. Um, the advantage of using Yasa is that it's a technology-based model, which can therefore look uh, into more details about the emission sources and how the emissions can be improved in the different scenarios. Once we have the emissions, we go on to calculate the concentrations of two key pollutants. That's fine particulate matter, so PM2.5, and ground level ozone. This is because uh, the concentrations can then be considered at the spatial level, and also they are actually the driver of the biophysical impacts of air pollution, which constitutes our next step. So we go on to calculate the health impacts. Uh, which we calculate within actually um, a module um, of the EMV linkages model based on the concentration response functions of the global burden of disease. Um, and then we also calculate the impact of air pollution on crop productivity using the GRCTM plus model. Now, the last step is that to look at the economic feedbacks, and that is done within the OECD EMV linkages model. So we are looking at the how the biophysical impacts of air pollution to health and crop productivity affect economic growth um, within EMV linkages. Additionally, we also look at the welfare effects of air pollution and specifically we attribute um, economic uh, an economic value to the premature deaths and the um, cost of pain and suffering from air pollution related illnesses. So that's that part we do as a class outside the EMV linkages model. All right, so in terms of policy scenario for this project, um, as I said, we're comparing um, current policy action, so uh, current legislations, to policy action that aims to achieve the maximum technical and physical reduction of air pollutants. Here, uh, we're basically looking at improvements in combustion plants, industrial processes, transport, so in terms also of the vehicles and types of fuels used, um, agriculture, use of solvents, and then finally, um, emissions from the residential sector. In terms of the benefits, we look at um, um, improvements in labor productivity. So once there are less illnesses uh, caused by air pollution, people become more productive. Um, also, um, differences in health expenditures. So as people uh, get healthier thanks to air quality improvements, they'll spend less on air pollution and more on things that they prefer to um, health expenditures. And uh, finally, in improved crop productivity. So. And on one hand, we have these benefits when we reduce our pollution, but in order to reduce our pollution, uh, there are also investments needed to deploy the best available techniques and achieve the emission reductions. Now, these investments are uh, modeled within EMV linkages as additional sectoral um, expenditures. 
and they're relative to the technologies and factors I've already mentioned. Uh, so these are, for instance, large-scale stationary processes and combustion processes, road and non-road vehicles with uh, improved uh, uh, techniques, and then residential boilers. Uh, but they can also be incentives and regulations that are um, assumed to uh, um, ensure set improvements in energy uh, efficiency. So, um, all that, like some of the energy efficiency that are also in coincidence with um, some climate change policies are also taken into account. So, um, in terms of the, as I said, we're looking at different geographical coverage of the scenario. So, this slide provides an overview of that. So, we start with the current policy scenario in which basically the three countries as well as the rest of the world are just ongoing with current policies. Uh, then we have three scenarios in which each country um, implements um, the policies alone. So it's just Japan, only China, and then, um, sorry, only Korea and then only China. And the rest of the world keeps going on in current policies. Um, then we have a scenario in which the three countries act together and the rest of the world continues in current policies. And finally, uh, in order to check um, trade and competitiveness effects, we also consider a global policy action scenario. All right, so I'll go on to uh, show some of the main results. Um, this slide shows the emission changes in the two scenarios, so with current policies and with domestic policy action. What we find is that um, already with current policies, there are emission reductions, as you can see, with the exception of NH3, which actually, which actually slightly increases with current policies. Um, however, with the policy action, more uh, is done, and for some pollutants, uh, the emissions reductions more than double, um, and then NH3 actually decreases also. Uh, decreases as well as other pollutants. So the uh, policy action is uh, effective in, in more effective in reducing um, air pollution. Uh, what does this mean in terms of um, air quality? Um, sorry. So this is the base year. Um, and once you look at current policies, you can see that even with current policies, there are some improvement in air quality. But there are further improvements if the three countries um, adopt more policies on air pollution, and actually even additional improvements when uh, there is global policy action. Um, this is, uh, sorry, the previous slides were showing PM2.5 emissions, and these are now for, um, for concentrations of um, ozone. So again, this is the base year. Uh, this is what happens when um, with current policies. And as you can see, there are some improvements, but um, there are still some areas, especially in China, where ozone persists as a problem. Um, this is when the three countries undertake policy action. And this is when uh, there is global policy action. And what's interesting is that there is more additional benefit uh, from global policy action for ozone compared to PM2.5. And that's because there are more interactions with other neighboring countries, whereas for PM2.5, um, the picture we see for China is mostly affected by domestic policy action in China. Um, what are the implications of these air quality improvements on health and the economy? First of all, what we find is that there's <clears throat> a lower number of premature deaths, and the, uh, these effects um, are higher when there is um, more spread policy action, so with the coordinated policy action and then with the global policy action. But once again, what's interesting is that for China, what makes the biggest difference is uh, when China has uh, put in place domestic policy action, and then in China's case, there are additional benefits for from global policy action. Um, in terms of economic implications, um, I'll walk you through the slide, which looks a bit complicated. So what we find is on one hand, there are benefits from policy action, which, as I said, derive from improved labor productivity and crop productivity, as well as lower health expenditures. Um, and then on the other hand, the costs 
uh, which offset, basically largely offset the benefits. Now, the costs, as I said, come from the additional investments in the improved technologies, but in here, what we see is that it's a smaller effect because there are general equilibrium um, effects which reduce the overall cost, macroeconomic costs at the end. Um, the black dot reflects the net effect <coughs> from the benefits and the costs. And so what we find is that largely the effects are quite small and the costs and benefits offset each other. However, as um, policy action is more widespread, then the benefits start um, getting higher with the more positive effect uh, on the economy. This effect is, if we look, for instance, at Japan and Korea, the effects are a bit different with um, uh, Korea having initially higher costs than benefits, but then as there are more um, countries taking action, the benefits take over. So Korea has a stronger positive effect, like it, it's more pronounced in terms of the additional benefits from coordinated or international policy action. In the case of China, the story is a bit uh, different because what makes the biggest difference uh, is again, if China undertakes policy action. Um, and then there is an additional effect in, in the case of global policy action, which comes from both the benefits that come from abroad and the costs um, due to competitiveness, uh, well, international trade effects. But I'll walk you through the composition of the effects so as to better explain these results. So if we look at the benefits, first of all, we see that what makes uh, the biggest contribution comes from labor productivity changes, followed by health expenditures and then um, um, the agricultural productivity. Um, and what's interesting is that the agricultural productivity makes um, a stronger difference in Korea and in China, and especially in Korea when there is international policy action and global policy action. And that's because um, this, this is, part, I mean, mostly due to the effects of ozone. And um, there is a substantial uh, problem of transboundary air pollution, especially uh, from ozone in the region. So these results actually reflect um, what's known as well in terms of air pollution in, in the region. Now, if we go inside to the costs, <clears throat> this is a, the composition that shows the difference between what is the direct cost, so the actual amount of monetary investments that are needed to deploy the best available techniques, and then the indirect effects, which we decompose into a domestic effect. So what happens internally? And that's derived, for instance, by the fact that uh, additional investment will actually also boost growth to a certain extent by um, creating new demand for certain technologies, for instance, that need to be produced. Um, and then there is an international effect, which instead reflects um, what happens, like the, the role of policy action in other countries. So um, if we look at some of these effects, we see that the um, domestic, indirect domestic effect of, offsets the negative um, effect of the direct investment costs. Um, and the international effect mostly plays a role when we look at the global policy action. So what we see is that for Japan and Korea, uh, this international effect is positive. And that is because as um, these two countries are, let's say, in a context in which all other countries are undertaking policy action, they uh, regain competitiveness um, or the previous competitiveness effect of, um, um, are lowered, um, then this is negative for China. And that's actually not a competitiveness effect, but a, let's say, demand effect. What happens is that with the all countries um, putting in place policies, um, the demand for Chinese products uh, goes down, and therefore there is overall a small negative effect on the Chinese uh, economy from reduced um, exports. Um, all right, so I'm just going to wrap up the messages from the study. We find that 
ambitious policy action on air pollution in Japan, Korea, and China substantially reduces emissions and health impacts. And coordinated policy action would lead to additional benefits, especially for Japan and Korea. Global policy action would only marginally further decrease PM2.5 pollution, but it would help further decrease ozone pollution and therefore the impacts on crops. Um, we also find that the reduced policy action impact leads to economic benefits. Um, so the results from the macroeconomic analysis show that the, there are some benefits, but mostly the costs and benefits of set each other. But we actually find that, um, uh, I, I didn't present this, but we find that there are additional welfare effects that are positive. So from the uh, premature reduction in premature deaths and illnesses. Um, in this context, we also find that coordinated policy action results in an increase in GDP in Japan and Korea. Um, and yeah, as I said, besides the CG results, uh, there are additional welfare improvements um, that come from the premature deaths, uh, but also some effects that we couldn't take into account, such as benefits for ecosystems and also co-benefits cool for climate change. With that, thanks very much. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, now we have uh, 10 minutes for, for discussions. So Angelo posted a question here. Uh, he has a question. In your maps about ozone concentration, there is a persistent high concentration in the southwestern part of China under all scenarios. Is there any particular reason for that? <clears throat> so, um, in I think that part of China has high pollution level, um, mostly due to, to transboundary air pollution from other Asian countries. Um, and that's why you see that um, those emissions reducing, especially when there's policy action at the global level, which in this context, well, the most relevant part is the other Asian countries. Um, so I think that's that's what we find. And um, yeah, so that's a, a good suggestion. There's that's one reason, and then there's a part that's just purely purely geographical. It's the same as some northern areas where there is PM, but it's of natural origin. So there's one part that is the transponder air pollution, and then all that's remaining, let's say, it's just basically, you know, climatic and geographical characteristics. Okay. Uh, well, I don't see any other message in the chat right now, so I, I'll take advantage of my position here to, to voice my questions for you. Uh, so I have two, two, uh, I mean, two clarifying points in the presentation. The first one is, you have linked five. You have five steps in linking all the model, right? So, is is there any feedback between them, or is it just a soft link from the first to the, the final stage? But I mean, the, my my question is because pollution is, of course, it's uh, completely linked, or or the health effects and, uh, and all that to the to the level of economic activity, right? So, did did you do some kind of feedback across models or uh, some interactive uh... yeah that's an excellent question um so unfortunately it's only a soft link so we do one full loop uh but it's it'd be very hard to set up a full integrated setup because of the mismatch in um geographical sorry in regional aggregation so the TM5 fast model, for example, is a special, special uses spatial data. So it'd be quite hard to fully integrate the whole. Yeah, group. I see. Um, yes. So no, it's just a soft link. And in terms of the full feedback of, um, you know, if we were to consider more loops, let's say we tried to calculate that, and the additional percentage change that we see from doing that is quite small. So in fact, we only present results from one loop, but um, I think the conclusions wouldn't change. All right, well, 
that's that's always the same problem for uh, mm. for, ever, for all of us now when we do this kind of we are more and more linked to different models biophysical models with economic models and this problem is always there so there, there's a new question now from john one uh, hello elisa i have a question that uh, do you link health effect with average pm 2.5 concentration all over the year or consider the seasonal pattern because PM 2.5 concentration is much higher in winter than summer in China. So I wonder, we we using average concentration or just to make the health effect? All right, say. so um, again, excellent question. So um, the TM5 past model basically matches our data in terms of you know trends over time for air pollution for the different scenarios. With the information they have on uh, climatic, um, but climate change, but as well as geographical, you know, local um, characteristics and um, seasonal weather and patterns. So we obtain the concentrations, the average concentrations from concentrations that are calculated seasonally. That being said, when we calculate the health impacts, they are um, linked to just average concentrations. So we don't uh, consider we don't put them by season. It's just yearly concentration. Uh, it's it's kind of average uh, effect. Yeah, it's yearly right. average. So the, the, it's um, it's linked to yes, the average level over the year. Um, yeah. Good. Excellent. So I have another question. While my colleagues still think, and this is about funding. So in in all these kind of policies, you have all that those effects. You have the costs. You have the benefits. But how do you raise funds to, to do the investments? Yeah, so um, at the moment we don't actually, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, we don't set up the mechanism that links right. policies to the actual investment, let's say. So we don't have, uh, for instance, it is set up so that you impose a tax and then that stimulates investment. We just add um, we just add a mechanism thanks to which the uh, firms like will will basically invest um, into new technologies. So then you have a production that's cleaner with less air pollution, basically. So in that sense, it's basically a uh, I mean the way it's model, it's a it's each producing sector that makes a decision of investing more and that will lead them to increase the production. Yes, my, my question is that in, in the macro sphere, so the national account, this is equivalent to having a, a external funding for, for, uh, for the, because the economy will expand, of course, you're doing more investment, right? So, yes. and, and whenever we do this kind of experiments, we all always get a benefit, a GDP benefit. Unless you do this increase through a kind of technological deterioration, but I mean, it's, it's just a, 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 a food for for thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree. I think we we haven't modeled the initial incentive. Um, I'm I'm not necessarily unhappy about having a positive effect from the investment because as my colleague Rob Dilling just brought in the chat as well. That's part of the storyline and the current motivation for investment in improved technologies, both on, I mean, in this case, we're talking about air pollution, but it's the same for climate change and circular economy. The idea is that you're creating incentives to invest in better technologies, which then would lead to also boost the economy and your own sector. So, right. Yes, but my point is that this overestimates the results, the positive one, because if, if you have to raise funds in your economy, either you have to raise taxes or you have to reduce investment in other sectors, or you bring money from abroad. So I think that that's what's happening now. We Perhaps have the rebalancing of investment. Hmm? So we we do have a rebalancing effect of investment overall, I think. But anyway, oh, you, you do a rebalance of investment. Uh, oh, we okay. better, yeah. Okay. What, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we don't have a tool just set up so that we, we, we 
uh, we modeled the, for instance, the regulation themselves. We just right. sort of imposed this. But you have these macro constraints rebalancing yeah, the investment. Do. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Good. Interesting. Um, Rob, you want to add something? Can I add something? Yeah. So the idea is um, we have this savings as investment equation. It's a, it's a proper CGT model. So uh, the money has to come from somewhere, right? When you invest, right. it goes at the expense of something else. But the model starts off with um, with a relative shortage of capital in the economy. So productivity of capital is relatively large, which means that any investment, any any policy that boosts investments tend to have large multipliers, and therefore can contribute to GDP growth. Okay. There is another. Thank you. There is another question uh, from Xin uh, Chao. How sensitive are the results to the biophysical um, assumptions of cross countries flows of O3 and PM 2.5? Um, it's a good question. I We haven't tested that directly because of constraints. Uh, you know, it was already enough uh, work for the GRC to run all of these scenarios. Um, I would say that, of course, they are sensitive to it, but the um, I, I don't think it would change the policy conclusion because the interactions between the three countries are quite clear. Um, in terms of the um, the results themselves, it, it could lead to changes. But the whole setup has tons of sources of uncertainty. Um, I think, despite that, the conclusions are quite interesting. Well, okay. I think that if you don't have more questions, uh, our time is about to to come to an end. Thank you very much, Thank Lisa, you very much. Uh, for your excellent presentation. And now, John, I think we have two minutes until Angelo starts his presentation. Is this right? Or he could start immediately. Okay. Um, yeah, should I? Uh, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, start, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. according to the program, uh, the, the start time will be, uh, not, there will be, will be uh, five, five after nine, but uh, it's okay to start any time between because uh, maybe we can take a shorter uh, transition time between uh, talks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, may, okay, may I share ahead. my... Yes, yes, you share your screen and go ahead, please. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so, um, hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, my name is Angelo Grugel and this work uh, was prepared in collaboration with Joe Riley and Elodie Blank from the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. And our goal here is trying to understand if uh, pressures on land use change in the future, pressures coming from the uh, global level, would lead to some tipping point on land use change in the US. And I will explain what we mean about tipping points uh, later, uh, uh, as well as motivation to do. Well, this is a, 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 a first step in a project uh, financed by the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, trying to understand multiple forces that could uh, compound in impacts at the uh, economic, social, and natural systems, and it's building around a framework that we are calling. Uh, multi-system dynamic approach, and there is a community of scientists arising under this this multi-system dynamics approach, which I will explain a little bit further. So, um, our motivation has to do with uh, the land use change in the U.S. Uh, over time. We have observed a relatively stable land use in the U.S. Uh, in the last 40, 50, 60 years, 
but not completely stable. We have seen a small reduction in cropland area through time, a uh, slightly increase in grassland and pasture area, and a slightly increase in total forest and natural lands in the US. Uh, when we account uh, rural parks, uh, national, federal, uh, and, and, and state and, and municipal parks in the US and wilderness areas. So, in general, we see some kind of switching from cropland to pasture and some land abandonment back to natural states, but in a small, a relatively small extent. So, what we want to, to understand is if those trends are going to intensify in the future or if they are going to decrease in the future under different assumptions about global stressors or global force, like income and population growth, uh, change in yields, uh, climate change, change in trade, uh, change in diets toward more or less meat, and so on. Um, why are we concerned about that? Well, as uh, the U.S., it's a continental country, uh, we know that the land use uh, in, in the country has an important role in terms of carbon storage, biodiversity, uh, uh, agriculture production, and ecosystem services in general. So, uh, what we we want to answer in this, in this research is uh, if multiple force, multiple global and compounding force would lead to some tipping point in land use, land use in the future in the US. Well, what we mean about tipping points? Uh, in the climate change literature, tipping point is considered some forcing or some, some small change in some, some stress or forcing that will trigger a strong nonlinear response in the dynamics of the climate system. But the tipping point uh, expression is used also in other literatures, like in the business literature, and usually it means some changing uh, of direction. So in the case of the business literature, some change in the behavior of firms toward different practice and different ways to, to make profits. Uh, in our case, we will try to translate those, uh, those uh, uh, tipping points uh, 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 concepts in something simpler as a change in a stressor or in a forcer uh, will result in a greater than linear response in an outcome. Of course, it's, it's very easy to explain and to have some general idea about the concept, but how do we measure that? How do we quantify a TMP point? So we come up with a simple way to do that. Uh, if we think about some kind of force or stressor A under a system and the consequence of this stressor is changing that system by some amount represented by this yellow box here. And if you think about a second stressor that applied on that system would cause another size of impact on that system, those impacts, if I add them together individually, they are smaller than if I shock the system with both stressors at the same time. So when I shock the system with both stressors, if there are some reinforcement, some compounding effect that is larger than the impact of each individual stressors applied isolated, then we say that this is a tipping point. Okay, this is our simple way to quantify what would be a, simple, a, a, a tipping point. So given that, uh, the idea is just to answer uh, under higher stressors on land use change or lower stressors in, in land use change, are we going to see more land abandonment towards forest in, in the US or natural areas in the US, or are we going to see an um, uh, uh, increase in agriculture uh, areas in the US in the future? So uh, it's important to think that those questions come from a, a broader project where we are trying to apply this multi-system dynamic approach where scientists from different fields, from the social sciences, economic science, and from the natural and, and environmental sciences, they get together and try to understand how those different systems, natural and human systems combined could lead to some challenge in the future in terms of higher risks, uh, tipping points, 
higher vulnerability, uh, and so on. So this multi-system dynamics approach, uh, it gets the perspective of complex interdependent systems from the natural and from the human side, and the interaction of those natural systems could lead to vulnerabilities or to resilience that we don't know yet because we, ha we haven't combined enough information and modeling from those different fields, right? So we are not going to tackle all that is in this multi-system dynamic modeling framework. As I said, this is the first step in our research where we are looking at some stressors and influence on the cropland, uh, on the land side, and we want to understand vulnerabilities and tippy points or resilience on that vector and how it spreads through the economy. Of course, this multi-system dynamics modeling framework, it's really something that we can fit into as uh, general equilibrium modelers, since our models, our uh, comfortable general equilibrium models, show their interrelationship among several sectors in the economy. Uh, the framework, the multi-system dynamics mo uh, framework, wants to expand that not only to consider the economic and social side, but also the, also the, the natural or, or, or ecosystem sides inside the package. So as a first step in our research, we try to jam a lot of environmental things inside our CG model. So we, we use the EPA agriculture model, which is a, a customized version of the EPA model. The EPA, it's uh, the economic projection in policy analysis model. Uh, usually this model had a configuration for agriculture that's quite simplistic. We just expand that configuration. And uh, we are worried here about how the global forces changes in, uh, changes in, in climate climate impacts on, on crops, uh, change in population, in, in economic growth, in meat demand, how those things at the global level would impact a particular country, the US. And in the future, we want to look at the local distribution of those impacts inside the US and how stressors inside the US could communicate back to the entire world. So then, we are in the first step of looking at the global scale, how stressors would impact a particular country like the US. So our model, uh, the EPA agriculture model, just expand the former version of EPA uh, that has had only three land use sectors. Now we have uh, more uh, uh, disaggregated representation of the agriculture sector based on the GTAP database, uh, GTAP 9 database. Um, and we try to represent the natural uh, uh, factors, the natural uh, ecosystems, mostly due to natural land use, like natural forest and natural grassland, but also we capture how those lands could be transformed to cropland, pasture, and managed forest, or those uh, uh, produced capital land could uh, get back to natural states. So, a non-technical uh, explanation of our approach. Uh, we are here, most of us uh, work with modeling, economic modeling, so you know the equations and, and the things behind this. This is a very generic way to represent what our model is capable to, to, to reproduce or to, to represent in the economy. So we represent explicitly natural grassland and natural forests in terms of area and in some uh, in, uh, income flow that it can provide. And uh, those areas could be converted by explicitly costs with capital and labor to some productive area, agriculture area. Those areas would produce, as most CG models, a lot of raw materials and raw uh, 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 agriculture goods. Those goods, the majority goes to some industry and will be transformed in some industrialized good, in food, in timber products, uh, in, in uh, clothing, apparel, and so on. And the households will uh, decide how much they want to buy from these goods, given their preference and their income, and they can just buy the raw material from agriculture, or they can produce, they can buy the uh, products from the from the industry, and they also will have choice to to buy services and goods from other sectors. So most of the CG models that we work with 
have all this representation, but what we have that not many CG models try to represent here is the uh, a kind of generic or abstract way to, to, to show that those natural areas are providing ecosystem services and households give some value or some preference or some choice for those environmental goods. And when we calibrate the model to the historical path, we are able to represent that in some particular countries like the US or the entire European, European Union, or even in China, the, the, the forces here balance in terms of a net increase in natural areas and a net decrease in agriculture areas. And depending on the stressors in the future, depending on the forces in the future, we can observe that uh, under lower pressures on land use change, maybe those agriculture areas in some regions could return back to natural states. If we have a stronger stressors to, to produce more food and more agriculture, we can see a more intensification of transformation from natural areas to uh, agriculture areas. So, um, how do we try to answer our question under this multi-system dynamics approach? So we do a kind of uh, scenario exploration approach where we uh, implement several uh, shocks in the economy, uh, in the global economy, where we change uh, trade to increase trade or to decrease trade, or we, we, we give uh, some shocks of negative impacts on crops worldwide or positive impacts on crops. We increase uh, the rate of uh, uh, technological change uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the improvement of yields for, for, for agriculture, or we decrease that technological change rate. We increase meat demand, we decrease meat demand, and so on. We, we apply each one of these shocks individually, and at some point we apply all shocks together. and we apply uh, both uh, stronger shocks or shocks that will increase the pressure on land use, and we apply shocks that will decrease the pressure on land use. So those shocks, those direction of shocks that theoretically would increase the pressure on land use change, we, we call higher pressure scenarios. Those shocks that will decrease the pressure on more agriculture land, we call lower pressure scenarios, okay? And our simul horizon simulation is 2015 to 2050. I, I, I typed it wrong here, 2010. 2015, when we start the shocks. Uh, this scenario exploration approach will allow us to see uh, how land use change will behave in the US compared to a baseline scenario where we have average assumptions about tr uh, trade, so trade tariffs will remain, uh, economic uh, growth and population growth will follow the average projections from international institutions and so on. So what we get as a result from this approach, um, if we look at the historical land use patterns in the US, uh, this historical pattern from 1978 to today, it's a slight increase in pasture areas and in natural forest areas and a decrease in managed forest and in cropland. So we see a lot of substitution uh, from crop to pasture. It's what is happening in the historical period in the US. Our business as usual scenario is just reproducing that since we parameterize the model to behave based on the elasticity we calculate in the past. And under lower pressures toward land use, what we see is an increase in the area uh, of, of, of pasture land and a decrease uh, in the area uh, of, of cropland. And the opposite we observe on the higher pressures. Well, actually there's something, oh yeah, what, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what we see is a, is a decrease in the expansion of pasture area compared to the business as usual, and a, a, a lower transformation of cropland uh, under lower pressures on land use chains. And the opposite, if we have higher pressures on land use chains. So we see pasture will increase more and cropland will decrease even more and manage forests even more if we have higher pressures for land use change in the future. And the, those higher pressures are related to, uh, to feed a higher population, uh, higher economic growth, 
or lower increase in yields and so on. So uh, with this, uh, are we able to answer if we have tipping points or not? So if you look at those changes from 2015 to 2050, it's a little bit hard to see if there are tipping points on our shocks or not. To get some better idea about tipping points, if we compare this final, this, this business as usual area with the uh, total area coming from the other scenarios, what we want to see is that in 2050, compared to the business as usual, uh, our shocks are promoting much more changes than in the business as usual. So it's another way to look at the results. So compare business 2050 results in our shock scenarios against our business as usual scenario. And what we see is under lower pressures, uh, we have expansion of cropland compared to the business as usual and a decrease in pasture areas. And under higher pressures, we see the opposite. But then it comes to our metric of uh, our theoretical metric about tipping points. So when we shock uh, individually each one of these stressors to our system, and we see this change, we forget those changes. And outside of the model, we just sum those changes. The sum impact is much larger than applying all the shocks at the same time. What means that it doesn't show any evidence of tipping points taking our initial approach how to deal with tipping points, how to measure, quantitatively measure tipping points. So the combined impact of all the, the shocks at the same time is lower than just summing up each individual impact here from each individual shock. And the same will happen in the case of higher pressures. And the higher pressures we see uh, pasture lands increasing on cropland and managed forest. And, and natural forest, and the sum of all the impacts together, if I sum all these bars for the individual shocks, uh, the impact is much larger than just applying all the shocks at the same time. So somehow there's some, uh, uh, when we shock the model with more economic growth, some of the land use transformation that we see, it's enough to accommodate more population growth when those things are, are, are set together. So there's no evidence of tipping points. Of course, as we have a CG model, when we present that for the environmental scientists, they like to see how those shocks will spread through the economy in several sectors. So is, this is just a sample what we can show to them, how those compounding effects are impacting multiple sectors at the same time, and the multi-system dynamics approach uh, in part, is concerned about these multiple impacts to the, the to the economy. What we are very uh, 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 familiar with in the CG modeling, and uh, if we just give a zoom on this part of of the results, we see that usually the when, when we apply the individual shocks here, we don't see that much change in most of uh, agriculture. But when we compose all the shocks together, we see a lot of change. And in some cases, we would be able to say that- Two we, minutes we have, left. Okay, that we have some kind of tipping point going on when we look at some specific variable like exports of crops. So all the shocks together have a strong effect than uh, adding each uh, uh, shock individually. Uh, of course, we can talk about price. Uh, the model can capture price and it's uh, something that the environmental models cannot do, and they like to see those kind of features. And the message here is very straightforward. Uh, if we have a higher pressures on land use change, we have a higher prices on, on uh, agriculture goods. But those prices increase much more in the livestock sector than in the crop sector. And finally, although we don't see the tipping points on land use change, we see some concerning results in terms of environmental uh, impact. So uh, to get that, to compensate that higher pressures on land use change and don't see that much land use change, there is a lot of increase in the fertilizer use. So the, if we combine all the high leads to higher uh, N2O emissions. And as the livestock system is growing in the US under our shocks, we have much more methane emissions and more cumulative 
uh, emissions from land use change, from pasture, from crop land, being in, in forest land being converted to pasture land. Of course, we don't see the tipping points. So when we combine all the shops together, the size of the impact is lower than just adding outside of the model the individual impacts uh, summing them up. Well, uh, just to finish here with my results, we, we know that the model answer given the parameters that we put in the in the, the, the behavioral parameters that we use in the model. So we test if our, our, our res, main result about no tipping points on land use change will, will remain if we do a lot of sensitivity analysis. We just pick some of them here to see that, that we have just one parameter, one elasticity that can make the results much stronger. Uh, so we can see much more conversion from cropland to partial area if we reduce our low uh, our intensification elasticity what is the intensification uh, elasticity? okay well let me just conclude so my conclusion is there's no evidence of tipping points um we see that the pressures that, that have occurred in the past will remain in the future we see the same trends but concerning results in terms of environmental indicators well that's it thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Angelo, for this excellent presentation. Uh, now we uh, discussion is open. Um, here I have an, a, an ask, a question from Andrew. How is land use change calibrated? Are transformation possibilities asymmetric? It's kind of the, more or less the same question I was going to ask. Yes, uh, they are asymmetric. We don't use a CET approach to do the land transformation. What we have in the model is one approach that we call land transformation, where you need to add capital and labor and inputs to move from natural lands to uh, agriculture lands. And um, between agriculture lands, also you need to uh, change the, the land by adding capital and labor if you are going from a less value land to a higher value land. Example, usually if you transform some land from pasture to crops, you need to improve that area to support crops. So you need to add explicitly amounts of capital and, and, and labor and inputs to do that transformation. It makes the, uh, the transformation asymmetric uh, if you go in the opposite directions. Yes, well, while we wait for new questions, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. Uh, CG models are typically, even if when they are non-linear, they are normally very linear in, in the first difference. Right? So this kind of non-linearity is probably linked to some non-linear form you have in your model. So I can think of two two sources, but I'd like to see your your uh, your position on that. First, first one would be the land supply, right? And and uh, I'll, I'll appreciate if you can talk a little bit about that. And the second one is on non-homotetic forms for demand. Is it right? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's a very nice question. Usually, uh, the models have, uh, the way that we produce, the way we construct the model with elasticities, we, we tend to have some kind of answer that is not exactly linear, but it doesn't go beyond non-linearity that, that strongly. Uh, as we build the model in GAMS, we are able to build the equations not as uh, uh, as uh, first difference equations. We, we have the equations in lab, and then some equations will be non uh, will not will be nonlinear by nature since we have we have CES CT functions. But something that is very interesting, although the model with the elasticity tend to respond with less than proportional impacts usually, we can stress the model at some point where it will cause some compounding impacts that will lead to tipping points. I will give an example of a former paper that we have done uh, about this. Uh, and it has to do with the paper that you presented yesterday. So there are a lot of mechanisms in the model that could accommodate uh, some impacts, climate impacts on yields. So we can have crop switching from one place to the other because they, they are suffering different impacts from climate change. We can have pasture being transformed to crops to compensate loss in yields if we have climate change impacting negatively the crop yield. 
uh, and we have consumers that could shift among uh, different goods if the good that he likes to consume is becoming more expensive because of climate change impact use of that good. When we shock all those, uh, uh, all, all crops and all the livestock system and the pastures to the same direction, if we put all with negative impacts of climate change, we have a more than proportional impact on, 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 on welfare, land use and, and, and other things because we shut down all the mechanisms at the same time. So although the CG model, if you shock one, if you give one type of shock in the system, uh, it, it has a lot of ways to accommodate that and give non-linearities. When you stress the model with so many shocks in different variables, you can shut down many of those things they cannot those measure mechanisms. anymore. And yeah, you will have a reinforcing impact of one shock with the other. It's not the case in, in, in our research here, but we have seen that in other cases before. So uh, we don't need to, to put some strong non-linearity to see those, those kind of behavior. All right, right? thank you. Th there's another question from Jing. Uh, what was the tipping point of land use means exactly? It's, uh, well, uh, we try to define that here as a change in the trajectory of the historical past under higher pressures. So what will be this change? If uh, we have seen in the past uh, substitution of cropland and managed forest by pasture land and, and, and natural forest, we will see this trend to reverse or to accelerate much, much more than what we have seen in the past. To try to quantify that, we did a very simple metric. Under two different stressors or three different stressors, if the sum of each individual stressor it's larger, it's smaller than when I apply all the stressors at the same time, I will have a tipping point. So if I apply force A and force B, and force A gives some impact, some change, force B, another change, if I sum up those two impacts individually outside of the model, and I compare that with shocking the model with force A and force B at the same time, and the result of this shock together will be larger then the sum of the individual shocks, I would have a tipping point. So a more than linear impact. What could be thought about some reinforcing effect among those shocks together that make the resultant be larger than giving each shock individually? <clears throat> did, I, what, did I make it clear? It's, uh, it's still from Jing. Uh, oh, there's another question from Jing, so you can keep, keep explaining. Uh, same question for the supply elasticity of cropland. Does it vary especially or by scenario? Well, it, uh, each country has a different supply elasticity, but we don't model different supply elasticity inside the U.S. As, as our model has the U.S. as a region, we don't uh, we, we have the same supply elasticity for the entire country. When we do the sensitivity analysis, we have we reduce by half the elasticity in every countries in the world and see what happens in terms of impact. And we see that we, we still don't have tipping points, but we have more conversion of land if we if our intensification elasticity is reduced by half. Right? So so your model doesn't capture any subnational details, but everything is uh, counted at the national level. Yes. And the next step in the research will be we, we have a US uh, state level model where we are uh, improving, we are representing land use change, we are, we are building the representation of land use change inside that model to be able to capture that spatial variability inside the country. Yeah, I think sometimes the total amount probably is less important than the pattern, because uh, even if uh, the same amount of maintain the same, and if the new land is uh, going to be in the um, other stressed area, like a water stressed area, then because you're considering the MSD, um, so the, the stresses itself uh, will uh, themselves will be interact with each other and may, maybe will be another driver for the tipping point. Sure, uh, and this is the next step. We, we need to, to look at the regional level inside the US. At the, uh, at the national level, we just set the boundaries. What the system shows if we just consider the global force at the at the continental level of the US. But you are completely right. To look at the environmental impacts, 
we need to narrow down and it's the next step of the research. Very impressive. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. We have a time for a final question from Xin Sao. Uh, uh, could be there a regional tipping point? Sure. Uh, we believe that it's going to happen when we build the regional model. And what we have seen in the US, it's an increasing forest land uh, and pasture land in some parts of the country. And some other parts, we have increasing crop land. So it's not uh, equally distributed that uh, general impact that we see. So we, we see the net when in our research, when we look at the US as, as a total, uh, but we, we can't capture with that framework. We need to, to narrow down our, our spatial resolution to, to see probably to capture tipping points at the local level. Can, you can, if you can imagine the Mississippi Basin River where we have places that are highly fertilized today and have high irrigation, probably if we stress in that point, we will get tipping points there. Okay, Angelo, thank you very much for the excellent You're presentation. Um, I think it's, uh, we run out of time now for this session. So we must go on and uh, start the next one, which is the role of global agricultural market integration in multi-region economic modeling. Using hindcast experiments to validate an environmental model by Xin Chao. You should immediately start, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. All right. Let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xin uh, Zhao. Today, I'm going to share with you our recent study uh, validating multi-regional economic models with high-cast experiments uh, with a focus uh, on the role of uh, uh, global agricultural uh, mar market integration. Uh, this work is a, a collaboration with my colleagues, including uh, Kate Kelvin, Marshall Weiss, and uh, Goku Iyer uh, from uh, uh, John, John Global Change Research Institute of uh, PNL. Uh, let's get started with a very brief uh, background. So this table uh, shows the a comparison of uh, uh, the models uh, in terms of their trade modeling uh, that participated uh, in the AgMIP uh, model inter comparison project. Uh, so uh, basically, this uh, Armington approach is uh, very widely used uh, for uh, empirical uh, trade modeling. And uh, all those models are still uh, very vi widely used for uh, different purposes. And uh, particularly for uh, G-type-based uh, CGE models, almost all of them are like Armington-based uh, uh, trade modeling. Although on the other hand, uh, for uh, partial equilibrium models, uh, the like uh, hectoline based uh, 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 fully integrated world market modeling is uh, still being used uh, with different uh, additional constraints across different models. Uh, so th the model I'm highlighting here uh, on the bottom is, uh, is the GCAM model, which is a model uh, developed uh, uh, in our group. Um, we recently updated uh, the trade modeling from this hectoline link to a logit based uh, Armington approach, which I will explain uh, later. Um, but this model is uh, a widely used uh, integrated assessment model. It, it has been used uh, for uh, the development of uh, shared social economic pathways and also uh, representative concentration uh, pathways. The model uh, by default runs to uh, the end of the century with a five year uh, time step. It's a partial equilibrium with uh, a very detailed representations of uh, uh, agriculture and uh, energy sectors, uh, and also with interactions uh, of, of with uh, other systems such as the land, water, and uh, climate. And when we talk about uh, this Armington approach for uh, trade modeling, it's uh, fairly common, uh, co commonly used uh, in uh, CG models. So it, it assumes that uh, products are differentiated uh, by their origin. And also, it explains this uh, uh, price differences using this uh, uh, preference bias across different sources from the consumer's perspective. And uh, and usually we use uh, nested 
uh, structure for, for this and the modeling uh, uh, regional computation between domestic versus imported products and then another uh, level at the international uh, computation. And uh, so when I was uh, talking about this uh, logic based Armington approach, it's very much similar uh, to the traditional uh, CES based uh, Armington approach. The only difference there was a uh, function form. And, uh, and also under this logit uh, based Armington approach, they were using this uh, logit sharing function. It's, uh, it's also very similar to the CES uh, function form. And there is uh, this uh, logit exponent in, in, in each nest, and there will be a preference uh, share weights to uh, control the, the relative preference in each nest. Uh, although this function form is uh, it performs relatively better uh, in terms of tracing physical trade volumes, and also there are some connections to the to this recording trade modeling framework, as this approach was derived uh, from extreme value functions. Uh, so there there are some connections uh, to the uh, micro level uh, heterogeneity uh, of uh, products on the demand side. Uh, although it, it shares the same concerns with uh, any standard uh, Armington models, which is that the preference parameters here uh, are calibrated to the base year, and they are uh, generally fixed to the initial value, even in the future periods. So then it comes to, uh, comes to the question that should those preference parameters or say uh, the distribution of those param parameters be fixed uh, over time or say can we use uh, the, those preferences in year 1995 to represent future periods? Uh, the answer is probably not because uh, like uh, based on a lot of related uh, gravity literature, those, pre those preference parameters are uh, capturing factors like uh, uh, relative distance and the culture and adjacency across different regions and also other factors uh, such as uh, imperfect information and non tariff barriers and a lot of those factors could be changing over time uh, with uh, changes in for example uh, telecommunication technology or uh, globalization and the market integration so that means like a uh, uh, assuming those factors to be fixed could cause issues such as uh, missing globalization issue. And also it, it may affect the uh, estimates of uh, related trade parameters. So in this uh, study, uh, we are kind of motivated to uh, explore um, uh, market integration scenarios within this uh, uh, Armington framework. Uh, 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 but uh, as we know, there was a study like uh, almost uh, two decades ago uh, from now, like uh, it kind of depicts this uh, uh, preference bias erosion is saying that uh, uh, the, the, the Armington preference bias could be changing over time and there could be uh, to, to represent a trend of market integration. Under the framework of this logic based Armington approach, it can be modeled as uh, the shifts in those preference uh, distributions. And they kind of created a method to introduce uh, a parameter, which we call this a converging, converging rate of preference parameters, because those, those uh, preference, preference parameters are relatively defined. So whenever this uh, uh, converging rate is uh, bigger than one, that means there will be reductions of preference bias over time, which, mean, which could imply market integration over time. And on the other, other hand, we also tested another uh, uh, market integration scenario, which we developed and uh, called this uh, uh, full homogenization. Uh, this was actually the starting point of this, uh, uh, this paper, which uh, we actually started to create a, create a dynamic reconciliation between this Armington approach and the fully integrated world market. But I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, a lot of, I mean, on this scenario uh, here. You can, uh, you can see more details in the paper. 
uh, because from our results, this scenario is, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, only testing uh, bias erosion, uh, erosion is a lot better than than this uh, full homogenization scenario, because a trend towards this fully integrated market is uh, not necessarily to be realistic. So there are more explanations. And there is like the, the reference scenario is just uh, no changes in those preference parameters. So we are going to compare those in this study. Okay, so the objective in this paper is just to explore the trend and impact of global agricultural market integration implied by dynamic changes in Armington parameters using height cost experiments. And uh, we are, uh, uh, we developed this uh, height, height cost uh, uh, framework so we can run historical validation across uh, 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 using data from uh, 1995 to uh, 2015 with five year time steps. And also we will uh, fit, uh, fit best parameters across uh, uh, for, for trade parameters and also compare those integration scenarios to see the potential improvements there. And also we will test the uh, implications of, of uh, incorporating this, uh, uh, this integration trend in this uh, uh, GCAM model. Okay, so for this height cast model, we are trying to keep this uh, really small, uh, mainly due to computational, uh, computational concerns uh, here. So uh, right now we are including only six regions, it's uh, separated by six continents, and the six crops, only for uh, major crops, and one aggregated uh, other crops. Also two level uh, low jet based Armington trade. There is also uh, 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 ag production based on land supply and uh, also CES demand here. There are many exogenous variables uh, in this model, like uh, total crop land supply is exogenous, uh, and also yield, uh, trade, trade policies and, uh, and the margins, and also uh, biofuel policies. Uh, we are using those data from FAO, and we created a small R package, so to use the solar in R to directly solve this model. Uh, to give you an idea, I mean, of visualizing this uh, this model, what this model is doing, as uh, this figure shows you uh, market equilibrium for soybeans, uh, mainly for trade. I mean, in uh, in 1995, so the x-axis here is uh, is quantity, and the y-axis uh, is price, and uh, the the columns here are uh, consuming region or importing region, and the, the the, the rows here, each row is uh, supplying region. So for example, uh, those uh, those uh, sub-figures I highlighted uh, in right here represent the uh, Asian soybeans import in 1995. Uh, I mean, this one is just a domestic use from, from Asia. The other two is from North America and uh, South America, uh, respectively. So like uh, over time, we see the changes in those market equilibrium. That's that's all like uh, what the, what those uh, economic equilibriums are uh, doing. Uh, to uh, in the past twenty years, uh, we, we have those those trend, and also those are actually just uh, real data. And in this model, we will just simulate those data and then compare those results with the real data to do this uh, uh, height cost uh, optimization. Uh, and we we can calculate this uh, error term. We are using this weighted mean square uh, log arrow. I mean, we tested uh, uh, different arrow terms here and different weights uh, in the paper. But it, this one is uh, essentially uh, measuring the distance between estimated and observed market uh, equilibriums. And we are using this consumption, consumption shares as weights in, in this calculation. So there's additional solver in this package to minimize this, uh, this arrow by changing the key parameters we are exploring here. So the, the base parameters are just the Armington elasticities, which, which is, uh, uh, includes the two loaded exponents as a two level. Uh, and also under the market integration scenario, uh, under this uh, bias erosion scenario, we, we allow this uh, uh, converging rate, which we defined to change. There's uh, like a year specific converging rate uh to be to be changing to to find the the, the best solution here 
let's take a look of those results. So this, uh, basically, this uh, lesson row is a result from uh, the, the integration scenario of uh, bias erosion. Those are the uh, Armington elasticities at the regional and the international level. And uh, here are the integration parameter, which are, uh, which are the, the converging rate we defined. So whenever those parameters are bigger than one, which means we discover this trend of market integration from those historical data. And uh, oh, I didn't show, show uh, in this table, all those values are uh, statistically significant. And also, uh, we, we also saw a trend of increasing uh, rate of market integration over time, uh, which would make sense. And also, if we see this 2010 value, the increase from, from previous period was uh, relatively small compared with uh, other periods that likely ref uh, reflects uh, the fact of uh, uh, food crisis around 2011 and also the period around 2010. Uh, but when we compare this, uh, uh, this scenario, We lost you. Okay, mm. it's back. Uh, we we lost oh. you for a minute. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? No, okay, that's okay. Did you hear uh, me explaining the uh, the bias erosion scenario? Yeah, we lost you when you were uh, explaining the the 2010. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to say uh, this 2010 uh, integration parameter, this conversion rate. Is, uh, I mean, the increase from the previous period is relatively small than the increase in any other uh, periods. It's kind of reflecting uh, the, the food crisis around these periods, like 2011 and 2008. And also, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, I was using like a five-year average data here. Um, uh, also, like uh, this scenario has the smallest arrow compared with uh, no integration scenarios. Uh, all, uh, of course, because uh, there, there was a higher uh, a degree of freedom uh, in this scenario. But let's take a step back to see this the, the, the default scenario where we were using the literature parameters of uh, Armington elasticity, which is a kind of uh, on average three and six, which is also from the uh, cross sectional estimates. Uh, we had a Relatively, I mean, actually, it's a significantly bigger error terms in, from those uh, 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 historical validation results compared to uh, results, I mean, allowing integration. All the results, I mean, this second row here representing results where we allow out optimizing those two parameters. So, and uh, when we allow changes in those two parameters, they are they became much smaller compared with uh, the cross-sessional uh, estimates because of the consideration of the, I mean, time, seri uh, time series factors here. But generally speaking, the model performs a lot better when allowing this uh, trend of market integration as implied by this historical data. And uh, this value, the, 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 the 1.37, is uh, kind of the integration rate relative to the base year 1995, um, the standard error is uh, uh, 0, uh, 0.05. And this value is actually implying a half life of about 45 years. This value also implying, uh, how do I, I mean, explain this? It's kind of the, it takes about 45 years to reach the magnitude of 50% 50, 50 of the full uh, integration. So this is, this metric is, uh, uh, I, I have seen this metric being used uh, in other uh, studies for studying mar market integration. So, and also this is a range of 95% uh, 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 confidence interval, like uh, uh, 37 to 57 years. Uh, okay, then I actually tested those values in GCAM. So basically GCAM had a reference scenario run all the way to the end of the century with uh, five-year steps. Uh, then I and also by default, those uh, preference parameters are fixed at the initial level. 
which is uh, 2015. Uh, so I was uh, interpolating, uh, I mean, it's not it's just uh, using historical information of this uh, uh, trend of home bias implied uh, by historical data, which means, for example, half year of uh, 45 uh, years uh, in this default scenario. It also implies like uh, the the uh, converging rate across preference parameters is uh, 1.08 per five year. And the, the two minutes I'll, left. Well, okay. I tested another high scenario, which allows like a, a faster integration. Basically, those are results for for net trade from uh, in by the end of the century. Uh, and we saw results uh, for uh, increasing imports. I mean, because of the more integrated market, there will be more imports for regions with relatively lower yield, but much more export for, from regions with higher yield. So uh, as a result of this trend of global market integration, and, uh, and also as a result of more balanced accessibility to uh, domestic and international markets re uh, reflected by this, uh, this uh, change of uh, parameters. As a result, the world average yield would increase in both scenarios, and uh, there will be land use implications across those two scenarios. And we saw a decrease in uh, cropland area by uh, by the end of the century. I mean, relative decrease uh, around uh, 27 to 47 million hectares for for global cropland uh, use change. Okay, this is a. Uh, I mean, there are many limitations in this study, but there are uh, plans for future tests, like uh, incorporating uh, more uh, coverage for uh, uh, crops and the regions. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, allowing uh, regional uh, and sectoral uh, differentiation of those parameters we are testing, uh, and also test uh, uh, many more alternative scenarios to see the implications. Okay, a quick summary. So basically, in this study, we uh, we started with a dynamic reconciliation between this Armington and the, and the fully integrated uh, world market approach for trade modeling. And then we developed scenarios for market, market integration within this uh, Armington approach. Um, and and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we showed that like allowing this uh, dy dynamic trend of market integration implied by bias erosion, I mean, had important implications in future uh, trade scenarios, and there were also implications I forgot to mention on the trade elasticities, and also, I mean, this approach practically uh, like a, a low long-term projections to, I mean, particularly for Armington models to consider uh, alternative uh, trade futures. I think I will just stop here and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sim. A, a very interesting presentation with a, a lot of things for us to, to think about. So while our, our colleagues prepare their uh, questions in the chat, I'll, I'll, I'll make my one. Um, sure, in the paper, you refer to, uh, to the single country models using Armington uh, formulation. But here you develop all your example in this global model. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the implications for for a single country. Of oh. course, we we understand all this, uh, the problem of, of erosion. But how do you how do you see this application for a single country? Uh, you mean you mean single country in model in single a single model. country modeling? Oh, sorry. Yes. Probably I didn't make myself clear. Like uh, even in the in the theoretical model, it was also like a, a multi-region uh, modeling, particularly because this is a. Uh, uh, Developed uh, based on this Armington framework, so it's uh, it's more like a generalized uh, Armington approach, I would say. So adding additional parameters in this Armington approach, although those parameters will be uh, like a few uh, future periods. I mean, you can change those parameters in future per periods to re uh, reflect this uh, uh, trend of market integration. However, uh, in terms of uh, uh, like if we just talk about the single. Uh, one, one word modeling. I have been like uh, thinking about those. It, I, I, I mean, generally speaking, if we do not specific, uh, I mean, trade or sub region in this one, uh, one word region, it's like uh, we were assuming most likely k 
kind of integrated world market if we just using one aggregated region. So uh, one thing I didn't like mention probably here, it's also something related to the aggregation. I mean, for example, from single model to a uh, single uh, country to multi-region modeling or to or from like a several region to more region modeling, they, they will uh, uh, make differences in terms of their uh, yeah. Trade specification and also integration scenario, particularly, um, and there are other related issues with uh, like uh, aggregations. We actually also discovered from this uh, this study. For uh, one example, is like uh, um, this Armington approach assumed. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, calibrate those uh, preference parameter based on initial data. Initial data matters. That means so. For example, if two regions are not are not uh, trading initially. From this Armington approach, they will never be trading in future periods. Sure, so yeah. it's kind of locked in the initial period. So, but from this approach we are developing here, I mean, we can uh, apply uh, more assumptions to change this uh, preference parameter in future periods to from zero to, to a value to bring in trade for those cases. So that's something we uh, have in mind also, I mean, will be tested in future. Thank you. We have more questions. I think that uh, the next one is, is from Jing and then Angela, but I think you can do it directly, Jing. Oh, yeah. So I was just wondering, can this um, method can be applied to the supply side of the model? So you're talking about Abington probably is uh, more on the demand side. The supply side, like, uh, can you have like evolving less supply elasticity over time? Uh... You mean land supply or or from trade uh, or generally supply side? Um, supply, I, I was thinking the production side because the trade oh. is more like uh, oriented yes. by the demand. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, the answer is uh, yes. Like uh, actually in this model we are running, I mean, uh, this GCAM model, um, in some cases they i mean on the land supply uh, for land allocation we are also using this uh, logit uh, structure for for allocating land across different uses and uh, for example uh, in 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 base year there was no biomass i mean uh, second generation biomass in many regions so in some cases we will just use this uh, i mean logit uh, sorry share this to bring in new land uh, to to re reflect the fact that in the future period Periods, there could be a production or, or say supply of so you, uh, of those land or say I mean this parameter is uh, directly linked to land supply elasticity in fact so uh, that, that also means I mean for the, the example of biomass is just a change of uh, land supply elasticity from zero to a positive value but it's uh, I mean changing this parameter in future period, periods also reflect changes of uh, I mean for other sort of uh, land supply. Uh, if we have better information on those, that that is uh, doable and uh, very easy to uh, be implemented. And is that part of the validation or hand casting? Uh, like, um... not not in this framework. Okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's a good. Point. But you can do it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Thank you. There's an, another question from Angelo. Angelo, you could do it directly. Okay. Um... Uh, Jin, I think it's uh, a very nice work. Uh, can you, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand a little bit your Hindcast experiment. Can you explain it a little bit better for us? Did you try to find, uh, did you set up the model to try to reproduce the historical data? And by doing that, it would choose what's the best set of parameters parameters for the Armington improved function? Is, is what you did there? Yeah, exactly. Great, great, uh, this, great. They started from uh, 1995 and to uh, to shop to future periods, like uh, four future periods, all the way to year uh, 2015, and uh, by changing like a lot across different scenarios, uh, by a, a lot of changes in Armington uh, elasticities and also the the, the count, this uh, we call this integration parameter, uh, which we introduce as a delta here. Uh, okay. to, to to particularly want to we, we were focusing on this uh, uh, this parameter which is uh, a converging rate of uh, preference so we want to see this trend of I mean historical trend of uh, 
or uh, for example, easing home bias, particular. Oh, yeah, this this is a particular for the regional competition, like uh, between domestic and imported goods. So, and we, I mean, at least from those data we tested, we saw this uh, trend of, uh, I mean, uh, reduction in home bias over the past twenty years. So okay, okay. So can I ask something else? Yeah, sure. sure. Go ahead. Yep. Um, you show when you do the projection for the future, you show that you had some increase uh, in, in yields by three percent or four point something percent as uh, kind of uh, as one consequence of this this new approach, right? Is this yes. three percent at the end uh, in two and one hundred, or it's three percent per year? What, what's the oh. measure here? And is it explaining your big decrease in the cropland area? Uh, yes, exactly. This this yield is uh, uh, directly explaining the the changes in in area. Although I mean it's a, it's global average across all uh, crops. This yield change is also in. Uh, I mean it's not uh, it's not annual change. It's uh, it's. Uh, it's a uh, yield in uh, uh, 2100 relative, I mean, from the integration scenario relative to the default scenario of no integration. So this value at global, global value is not that large. I mean, I mean, I was expecting bigger changes in yield, although at regional level, there could be, I mean, bigger changes uh, in terms of yield. So, uh, but basically when they allow this uh, uh, trend of uh, market integration or say, uh, Decrease in home bias, so uh, it, it it effectively kind of lower the the uh, the, the barrier across uh, boundary, uh, particularly for uh, non non type of barriers that is not not relative uh, represented in the model. So so which is also reflected in this parameter. That that's why we see uh, particularly increase of uh, export or say increase of uh, uh, Crop supply to the world from regions with higher productivity, but uh, for the regions with is relatively lower productivity, uh, Western Africa, uh, and they will just import relatively more because of this integration. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Sure. I think I think our time is is uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, sure. Thank you for the excellent presentation, and now we can move to the last paper in this session, which is. Uh, by Andrew Schreiber from the International Environment Protection Agency, approximate international linkage in a national CGE model. Andrew, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Can you guys uh, see my screen? It's apparently it's coming. Is it up, up yet? Or... Not yet, no. Let me, let me uh, stop sharing real quick. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but my computer is freezing on me. One second, please. You can listen, but there's no image coming. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a due to low bandwidth at local computer conditions. There's a, a warning in your uh, okay in your, yeah. uh, name here. Um, Andrew, another option is if you could email uh, your slides to yeah. either of us, that will work as well. Um, okay. I can, I can try to share. I've oh, got okay. the slides up. Let me see if. I oh, can great! Get. You're here, and yeah, I don't yeah, know why my computer see. is like completely frozen. Um, yeah, from your co-author, uh, it's also okay. Great. Yep. Did it? All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Can you make it yeah. full screen? What? Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Um, maybe the view. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, control L. You got yep. it. 
Okay, let me just figure out now how to mute myself so I'm not taking away from Drew. How do I do that? Thanks, Dan. You're saving the day. Um, just tell me when to when to yeah, change that's the slides. I, I still can't. I can't see the this uh, WebEx anymore. Anyway, so um, yeah, so th this work is is joint work with Alex Martin and Wolverton. We're economists um, in the National Center for Environmental Economics at the US EPA. Um, and it's it's about how can we um, use a reduced form methodology to approximate um, international trade linkages in a in a Did we just lose Andrew? Yeah, we we'll lose. Yeah, last time. Uh, Let's take a few minutes. He'll connect again. Hopefully. Well, hopefully he will rejoin us here momentarily. Sorry about that. Uh, in case uh, Andrew is encountering tech issues, Anne, would you be able to step in or? Um... Uh, that might be tricky. Let's see. Um... Yeah, we can we can wait a few more minutes. Yeah. Or can you reach reach out to Andrew, maybe texting him or you know him uh, see if he's. Uh, and uh, there's any possibility of coming back. My guess is he's having problems with his internet connection. Yeah. I believe my, uh, Alex, you're here too, right? My guess is that we could do a rough approximation of setting things up for him, <laughs> but then in terms of the results, it's re it's really been Drew who's been working on them. So, I guess maybe we can give it another thirty seconds, and if not, we can probably do a poor approximation of Drew to at least set the problem up, and hopefully, he'll be able to join. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Can you call in through WebEx? Mm, no, not, not if, if it's not connected. No, I mean, uh, calling uh, using phone. Probably oh, I not know. an option. Yeah, I didn't see a link for that. Uh, 
There's Drew. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I was talking to the screen. I wow. didn't realize I cut out. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah, maybe Anne can keep sharing. So, uh, Anne, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, we lost you right at the beginning, Drew. Just we so did. Know. You've Correct. been gone the whole time. Oh, that's that's great to know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on the outline slide. Okay. Um, um, next slide, then. Okay. One. So the topic overview. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, the, the, a common problem in CG modeling is you're you're often faced with the, the dimensionality trade-offs, right? You, you you'll likely tailor a model to incorporate certain features but leave out other features um, that may not be uh, super specific to the given policy application. Um, you know, so many models are designed for specific poly app policy applications. I have a colleague that likes to say models are horses for courses, uh, you know, that there are certain models that should be used for some areas and, and not others. Um, for instance, in energy economy models, you might expect more detail um, on the energy side and electricity production and so forth, um, and, and less so in, in, in say, ag, for instance. Um, you know, so uh, one, one area uh, of this more overarching issue is for highly detailed CG models of a particular country, um, the impacts of foreign trade are often simplified by assuming price taking behavior on the world market. And so, you know, this, in many cases, this, this assumption can be, may be appropriate, um, for instance, smaller countries or non-trade exposed sectors, um, but not so in, in others if if you're modeling a large country, for instance, the United States or, or in a heavily traded sector. Um, and and so solving this issue can be uh, non-trivial. Um, you know, it it could be given the the way that the model's formulated or just given bandwidth issues, uh, linking to something like GTAP might be infeasible. Um, and and so this work is going to be about ways that we can incorporate the rest of the world in a, in a national CG model without actually explicitly uh, representing it. Um, and so outside of being an interesting modeling question, you know, we're interested in this also um, uh, at EPA, uh, because in, in 2020, the Science Advisory Board, which is a, a group of independent um, expert modelers, uh, some of which are on this particular call, peer reviewed uh, EPA's SAGE model. And SAGE is, is an applied general equilibrium model. It's a, it's a CGE model of the U.S. economy with subnational detail. Um, and it's, it's a model we've spent quite a bit of time developing um, to uh, primarily to be used in studying environmental regulation and is carefully calibrated to a variety of government data sources. Um, you know, the, the initial version of the model that was uh, reviewed by the SAB was specified as a small open economy. Um, uh, but given the size of, of the U.S. economy, the, the SAB recommended that EPA relax this assumption and represent the U.S. as a large open economy, um, noting that doing so will ensure uh, that the model is able to capture the uh, regulatory impacts on traded goods. Next slide. And so, you know, just to set the stage for everybody, not that anyone needs it here, um, but, you know, what do we exactly mean when we're talking about a small versus a large open economy. Um, you know, so here we have a graphical depiction of what's going on. On the left side, it is the market for U.S. exports. Um, you know, there's, there's an upward sloping supply curve uh, that a single country model would incorporate. Um, so we have supp so, uh, exports supplied by the given country. Um, but in a small open economy assumption, we assume a perfectly elastic export demand curve, um, so that flat curve. Uh, and so you, you, you have a fixed price um, on, on the world market. Um, and so any, any impacts on exports and imports happen purely through quantity changes and, and not on price changes. And so the large open economy for U.S. exports um, would be to build in some curvature to that export demand curve in the form of the dotted line. And, and the same goes for the, the market for world imports coming into the United States. Uh, if, if we're thinking about the US, um, you know, the, uh, a national CGE model would capture a downward sloping import demand curve through say the Armington function. Um, but the small open economy 
assumption would, would mean that we have a perfectly elastic import supply curve, um, again, working in quantity space and not in price space. And so incorporating a large open economy assumption would be to add curvature to that function as well in the form of the dotted line on the upward sloping import supply curve. Um, slide. And so there, there are many ways that you could think about relaxing this assumption. Um, you know, two of the many two potential options would be to uh, a link to an existing international model. Um, there's a variety of examples in the literature where folks have done this. Uh, for instance, Justin Karen and others uh, linked in implant based uh, the US rep model with GTAP in, in an application on um, on uh, subnational leakage. Um, you know, they, the advantages there are, are that you would capture the full richness of the international economy. Um, but then there are, there are obvious disadvantages as well. Um, you'd have to require that the national model conform to the international framework. It, it may require extensive alterations and, and then subsequent maintenance costs to, to maintain two modeling uh, frameworks. Um, and I also wrote here that dynamics could be an issue. Um, in our case with SAGE, we have an intertemporal CGE model. And, and um, you know, if we were to think about linking that with GTAP, there, there um, is no inter intertemporal uh, GTAP model um, supported by, by GTAP folks. And so this, the second option would be to calibrate a reduced form mechanism to approximate international trade linkages based on an existing international model. Um, and this has also been done in the literature, for instance, um, May Wan et al. at MIT in 2019 um, with the US rep model and then Tom Rutherford and David Tarr earlier on um, have an example of this. And, you know, the, the key advantages here is that you can simplify the rest of the world and reduce burdens of maintenance. Um, but really the disadvantage is how do we actually parameterize the, the reduced form approach? And it's unclear how well it would perform relative to uh, a full-blown international context. And so the research topic of this work is to test a, a particular reduced form mechanism to introduce uh, price sensitivity in the world market without actually um, representing the rest of the world in the model. Next slide. And so more specifically, um, what this work does is it, it uses the GTAP and GAMS package, um, the most recent one, uh, to estimate behavioral parameters, to calibrate a reduced form approach. And then we take those um, estimated uh, or simulated values, we implement them in the GTAP and GAMS package in a single model case and compare um, a model with the rest of the world explicitly denominated versus a model with only a, a US denominated and compare sort of the, uh, the impacts on trade for a particular policy application. Um, and then we see how close we can get to what we consider the truth, uh, the, uh, a multi-region model in GTAP and GAMS versus the single, single region model. And then a third thing that we, we've also worked on is applying the reduced form approach to the more complicated stage model. Um, I'm not going to discuss that here, but there are a whole host of other considerations, um, particularly in the dynamic context. Um, that you know we we need to uh, uh, work on and think about in order to properly capture the trade responses. Next slide. So um, we adopt a, a methodology similar to what is in the U.S. rep model. Um, the the approach relies on fixed factors to calibrate the model responses to um, exogenously imposed elasticities, and those elasticities. Um, again, are, are something that we're going to simulate in the GTAP model. Um, and so, you know, specifically what this looks like is if we think about PM sub I denoting the import price of the commodity I, PE, the export price, PFX, the price of the foreign exchange, and then we have fixed factor prices. Um, we have the, the methodology summarized in these two pricing models. I think someone may be off the mute. Thank you. Um, so we have these two pricing equations, um, one for imports and one for exports. And the key is that the fixed factor um, PFIM and PFIX um, would be calibrated to match this exogenous, exogenously imposed elasticity. Um, 
And, and note that, as we'll see in the next slide, if the elasticity is large enough, the, the theta parameters uh, tend towards zero. Um, and if that happens, then um, uh, the import and the export price would equal the price of foreign exchange, which is then just reverting back to the small open economy assumption. Um, and so another thing that we consider here is um, a, a simplified approach um, where we have a single world price where the, the export and the import prices are the same. Um, and that simplifies the market clearance conditions in the in, in the model, um, and we uh, we test whether or not that um, can can approximate a two country or a multi regional framework. Next slide. So, this again, this this is a reduced form approach, and it doesn't model physical trade per se. Um, these fixed factors are unknowns, um, and so what we need to get at here. Or, is we need to use the GTAP and GAMS um, framework to simulate uh, price elasticities. And so the two elasticities that are relevant here is the price elasticity of the rest of world demand for US exports, um, and then the price elasticity of the rest of world supply of imports to the US market. Um, and so presuming we can simulate those, those reasonably, um, we can calibrate the fixed factors um, as shown here. Um, and again, as as those price elasticities get quite large, um, you would revert back to the small open economy assumption, which actually matters for the uh, import side of the model. Next slide. So uh, to estimate the values for epsilon X and epsilon M, um, you know, we use GTAP and GAMS. Um, in order to do so, you know, because we're interested in in average responses between the United States and the rest of the world, we aggregate the model to two regions. And then we also aggregate the sectoring scheme to match the SAGE model um, so that we can adapt uh, elasticity estimates directly from GTAP and GAMS to SAGE. Um, you know, the, the SAGE uh, sectoring scheme largely revolves around um, sectors that are more likely to be regulated uh, by the EPA, um, for instance, manufacturing, um, electricity, and so forth, or sort of tangentially related sectors where we think indirect impacts are particularly important, and we can calibrate um, energy demand and, and so forth along with AEO and NEMS. Next slide. So in order to simulate the price elasticities in the GTAP and GAMS framework, we construct that two region model um, we perturb the export price for U the U.S. to get the um, export elasticity, which is on the left side, which is negative, and then the export price for the rest of the world um, to get the, sec the import elasticity on the right side. Um, and so two things are, uh, I think, immediately obvious here on the export side and on the left side. Um, the elasticities are smaller. Um, they range from zero to negative 27, I believe, but that negative 27 is only in one sector in the natural gas sector. Um, so the exports at least are, are quite price responsive. On the right side, the import elasticities that are simulated are quite large, um, ranging from, I think, 1.5 in the crude oil case, which is sort of a special case, to um, actually over a a thousand. Um, there are two sectors here: truck transportation and and other transportation that are not shown because the elasticities are so high, and, and it skews the the um, image. Um, but so what that means is that um, given the very high elasticities, the um, uh, you know the, we we sort of get closer and closer to the small open economy assumption on on the import side of the model, meaning that any changes in the model will operate more through the quantity space and less through the price space. Um, and and I, there are two uh, color um, uh, dimensions here on the right side. It says calibrated and simulated. Um, the reason you don't see the two different colors on the graph is because we're able to, um, if we test, once we parameterize a single country model, um, testing whether or not the implicit elasticities actually um, uh, match the targeted values, um, they do almost exactly. Um, so it, so in, imposing these values in a fixed factor framework, they, it's, it's almost identical. 
Next slide. Uh, so we have four different model comparisons that we do. Um, we have a, a two country model, um, which again, we, re we regard as truth. I mean, this is a simplified static international framework. So, it, you know, it, it's op up for debate whether or not it's truth, but in this sort of laboratory setting that we find ourselves in, it, it's what we were regarding as truth. Um, we have two different ways that we represent the reduced form large open economy assumption, um, one with separately determine import and export prices to allow flexibility in, in terms of what the elasticities are, are calibrated to, and then one with a single world price across imports and exports to see if, if we can simplify the way that the rest of the world is, is represented and see if we match um, the two country model well. And then finally, we compare with the small open economy assumption. Um, the type of shock that we consider is a, a $1 billion sector specific productivity shock to mimic an illustrative environment of regulation. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but the, the way that it works conceptually is that we require additional inputs to produce the same amount of output, which, which is sort of a similar, which is a, a um, illustrative means of, of representing sort of your typical regulation that um, EPA might promulgate. Um, and then finally, the sectors that we're considering uh, here are just two. We, we do it for everything um, in, in uh, the working paper, but the, we, we consider the balance of manufacturing, which is a trade exposed sector, and then electricity, which, which is pretty limited trade to compare the difference. So here are the results. Um, this is on the export side of the model, the change in exports, the left hand plot is for the balance of manufacturing, the right is for the electricity. Um, the two, I think, colors that are are most important here are um, the the lighter green and the brown. So the lighter green, which is the bottom um, color, on I'm not sure why it's inverted on the, the legend versus the way it's represented in the graphs, but um, that's the two country model or the so called truth. Um, and then the brown is the large open economy two price. And as you can see, the the this is the quantity change in exports. The two country model and the large open economy two price simulation are almost identical. And the same goes for electricity, uh, where you have li more limited trade um, changes um, uh, given the, the difference in the sector. Next slide. Um, so here, this is uh, illustrating what the price impacts are of the policy uh, scenario. Um, again, the, on the export side, the the two country model results in the large of the economy, um, single country um, two price simulation are, are virtually identical. So we're able to capture the international trade linkages without actually representing the rest of the world here quite well. Um, you know, we, there, there are slight changes here. So you'll notice that in the small economy case, the price impacts are zero. Um, Two minutes so left. Okay, thank you, um, which is exactly what we'd expect. Um, and then in the large open economy world price case where we have a single price for imports and exports, you know, we're, we're not able to capture the price impacts very well um, because it's sort of an aggregate of the, uh, of the um, elasticities that we're calibrating the model to, um, which in the import case are quite large. Um, so we, we, it sort of skews the price impacts downward. Um, next slide. And then uh, this is the same thing, but on the import side. So again, the, these elasticities that are simulated are quite large. Um, and so the percent change, um, you know, in quantity here is, is a bit larger. Um, you know, again, the, the two country and the two price large up economy specification are almost identical here. Um, but because the elasticities are so large, uh, you know, the, the small open economy sim, um, assumption actually approximates the two country model quite well on the import side of the model. Next slide. Um, here uh, for the import prices, you know, there's a bit more heterogeneity, but uh, again, because the elasticities are so, um, so large, the uh, price impacts are very, very tiny, um, you know, on the order of magnitude of, uh, you know, 0 0.005%, uh, right? And so, um, you know, there, there is a little bit more wiggle room here between the two country model and the large open economy two price model, um, but the, the change is, is very minor. Next slide. And so just to wrap up, um, 
you know, that was a pretty brief overview of some of the work we've been doing, but the, the methodology works really well, actually, in a simple static model. We're able to target um, the two country model results with a single country model um, reduced form approach uh, almost exactly. Um, and, you know, we've explored whether or not things are sensitive to the size of the shock. Um, you know, the, the result is pretty robust, uh, two different um, shock sizes. I didn't uh, show it here, but welfare is also uh, similar across um, methods. And so the next thing that we're really working towards is implementing this in the SAGE model um, uh, carefully. You know, the things that we're, that we're working on is trying to hit elasticity calibration targets into the future, which, you know, it, it's, it's more difficult that in that case, but because we have a, a ton of different things going on in the baseline calibration of, of current account balance and trade balances and so forth. Um, and so this is sort of ongoing work. Um, and, you know, one final thing about the implementation in the SAGE model is that, you know, we, we have an intertemporal model. And so um, for the subsequent round of, of the work, we're, we're going to rely on comparing the small open economy and the large open economy reduced form framework in SAGE, as opposed to comparing to a sort of a, a multi-regional international model um, as, as true, and we'll sort of extrapolate based on what we find in two seconds. And uh, that's it. Um, the next slide, I have um, my email. If anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to contact. Uh, so thanks for listening. Okay, Andrew, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's uh, very, very interesting. And now we have some time for questions. I, I see that there's one from Angelo. Uh, he wonders if you have for, tried alternative shocks. So we alternative shock sizes. Sorry. Yeah, so we, we've we've experimented with changing the size of the shock, and um, in terms of you know the the magnitude, mm -hmm. what I showed was a billion dollars um, uh, a productivity shock, but you know decreasing or expanding that, the the results hold up. Um, what we haven't tried is. Uh, expanding outside of the productivity shock realm, um, see if there's any sensitivities there, but um, that, that you know, could be something that we do in the future. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Andrew, uh, okay. well, um, yeah, I think I think Angelo, you can yeah. uh, continue to address Angelo's question if it's related. Okay, okay. Result, uh, Angelo says that the results are very similar among uh, scenarios. So can we conclude that it's better to keep the small open economy approach? Very good question. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, that what I showed was um, sort of two examples of different sectors. Uh, these are sector specific shocks. Um, you know, on the export side, it's it's quite a bit more price responsive than the small open economy uh, assumption would suggest, and so you know if we keep the small open economy assumption, um, you know, you'd miss some of that price sensitivity there. On the import side, I, I agree um, the small open economy approach actually approximate approximate things quite well, at least as far as I've I've seen. Um, and but you know if we if we calibrate the the prices separately, um, we can capture the, the those two dynamics. Um, without increasing the complexity of the model uh, very, very much. Jean? Yeah, that part of my question as well, I was, uh, uh, as I was thinking, uh, what, what would be your response to the reviewer uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the science advisory board? Um, so thank you for your answer. And then um, I may have additional uh, quick question about, so at the very beginning, when you talk about two different approaches, the, the, the top one, which you didn't uh, follow was um, like a kind of a, um, link the, this model to GTAP, for example, for, uh, for the international part. Um, my understanding is uh, that's sort of the soft linking. So you run uh, GTAB, for example, first and get the price response and then add that to the partial equilibrium model uh, as a, a, a 
uh, exalted the shock. Is that right? I mean, you could you could do it in the, in, a, in a couple ways, right? You could integrate it fully, which the the, the paper that I I listed there is that's what they did. Um, sort of you build in subnational detail to the GTAP model, basically. Um, uh, or you know, I, I've also seen work um, where where you impose uh, GTAP uh, or results from GTAP model into um, you know a, a single country model. Um, you know, I think the advantage of the approach that we've taken is we rely on a lot of the work that um, experts at GTAP have, have done in terms of finding the right elasticity values and, and, and finding the right data and, and estimate the needed elasticities to parameterize reduced form approach. Um, so relying on experts in trade uh, to do that um, and then not have to uh, you know, worry about maintaining the soft linkage or, or other things um, that would complicate, you know, speeding up analysis, um, uh, you know, when, when we use the SAGE model. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Andrew, I'll, I'd like a little bit more uh, consideration from your part. You did the experiment for US. Do you think that using a different country with, you know, different trade structure could uh, significantly uh, change results, or that would be more important for another type of uh, trade structure. I, I could see that definitely being a possibility. Um, you know, the the export side of the model seems to be important um, because the U.S. seems to be a large player in the world market. Um, yeah. You know, for other countries, you know, that may be true, and for others, it, it might not be. Um, so, you know. The, I, I think that's the nice thing about this approach is that it can be extended in other other ways, and you can you can simulate the needed elasticities for a particular country, and then parameterize uh, uh, you know that country's trade side of the model to see if it matters. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we don't have more questions. You can say now or shut up forever. Uh, we're right on time. <laughs> <laughs> we're running on time, yes. So we're uh, right like on time, to, yes. <laughs> yes, we're right on time. So I'd like to, to, uh, to thank all the presenters uh, for the excellent presentations and also for the audience for joining us in this session. And uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can finish and hope to see you all in to half an hour in our plenary session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, and see you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.